All right, good evening, everybody. That's loud. Wow. <laughs> everybody doing good this wonderful Wednesday? Staying warm, I hope. All right, if y'all will, let's all stand and we'll get started tonight.
tonight that you've been saved by the grace of Jesus. Come on, you thank our singers and musicians one more time tonight as well. And then do me a favor if you would. Before you're seated, we don't need you to shake hands or hug necks, but just find somebody and say hello to them tonight that you hadn't talked to yet. Maybe cross the aisle and love on somebody. For those of you watching at home, 
Tonight, we want to welcome you to Osceola Church of God online, our adult Bible study. Back in house tonight, our young adults and youth and children spread out all over the campus. Braxton doing everything under the sun, <laughs> helping take care of us. Oh, God is good. God is good. God is good. So glad to be back in the room with everybody here tonight. want to welcome you and all of our, so we have some guests here with us tonight. Honored to have you. You, you drive cross, cross country, long haul trucker. You, you, huh? Just in the south area. Well, we're glad to have you. This is a good pit stop right here. We got the cleanest bathrooms in South Georgia right here, buddy. We're glad to have you honored. You just kick back and relax. This is our uh, Wednesday night adult Bible study. And um, our teenagers, I know, are having a great time next door. And kids upstairs and across the parking lot as well. We're praying for them. And for those of you who are home tonight, recovering and um, quarantining and isolating and all that good stuff. We miss you. Can't wait to see you. This too shall pass. Come on, somebody. This too shall pass. Some real quick uh, reminders before we get started tonight. We continue fasting. We continue our fast. We're halfway through already. That blows my mind. I think about that. We're already halfway through this thing. So um, <laughs> continue fasting. Continue reading the Bible with us. Um, uh, Pastor Robert's getting those scriptures posted every day uh, on Facebook to do the daily reading. You can also pick up one of the pieces of paper outside and we had decided I was going to do my, my one meal a day kind of fast for the 21 days leading up. And I came in the other day, and I sit down to eat dinner, and we get the food all laid out. And Nadine doesn't come and sit down. And I said, oh, you, you fasted lunch today? She said, I know. The Lord has just been dealing with me. I just think I'm going to fast some more. I felt guilty eating that steak. I said, <laughs> I'm going to hit eight. But then I thought, okay, I can't. I can't let this go, so we're pushing ourselves and stretching ourselves to do a little bit more. And I just encourage you this last half, push yourself to do a little bit more. Just say, God, thank you. I'm going to stretch. I'm going to um, sacrifice and crucify this flesh and prepare my heart for what you've got coming on the 21st. It's going to be good. I'm telling you, it's going to be good. So excited. Uh, Brother Floyd Lahan will be here uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning. Uh, we won't have a service Sunday night, but then Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, um, just in a week, a week Friday. It starts a week Friday. Uh, then brother, brother Tommy Combs will be here. We've been talking to them, and they're excited to be here. And was it Tommy that sent out the email? Brother Tommy. So Brother Tommy Combs uh, sends out these emails, and uh, I believe it was last week or the week before last at a church in Kentucky. A boy who is 10 years old, completely blind. This was just a week or two ago in Kentucky. And they prayed for him and ministered to him, and his eyes opened. Yeah. Y'all, that's God right there. I said, oh, Lord. Lord, do it again. Oh, Lord, do it again. So if you know folks who are sick or dealing with issues in their family, struggling with the bondages in their hearts and their minds, you tell them, hey, I just think this is going to be a special time for you to come. And uh, we're just going to pour gasoline on the fire. This Sunday night, our uh, kids uh, are going to have a fellowship next door. So at 530, they're going to start a little early Sunday. All of our Kidsville students, elementary students, they're going to be next door uh, having a fun fellowship night together. Also, parents, moms and dads, Grandparents, I guess, if you wanted to, um, uh, if you, you're interested in keeping updated with everything that's going on next door, it'll probably be a little easier for you. Pastor Robert has set up a new way, a new system to contact, to get messages out, information out. So there's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. If you'll sign up and let us know, uh, I'm a guardian or I'm a parent and I would like to be included in the announcements coming from Kidsville and coming from youth. Do that tonight and that'll be a little easier for us to keep up with you. And uh, that'll be a huge blessing. February the 6th, that's the first Sunday of February. We're having another celebration Sunday, baptize his hearts and still touch his lives. So we're going to build that Ebenezer, and it'll be a reminder. And every time somebody comes to church and says, why y'all got them rocks stacked up over there? We're going to be able to tell them. 
It's the Old Testament. That's in the Bible. Go ahead and put, stack those rocks. And when your kids ask, what's that for? I also need some help tonight. I need a couple of men to help me get a bridge. Brother Bobby uh, Williamson built a bridge for us. It's a wooden bridge. It's not real big, but built a bridge. It's down outside uh, of the shed down at the, near the pond. I need some help somebody getting it thrown up on the back of the truck and getting it in. And where we'll put it tonight is just down here, right here in front of the altar, so it won't mess up Singers and Musicians Sunday. Then Sunday after worship, I need some help getting it back up here on the stage. Um, the Lord has a word for us and our role for what uh, we're about to do and where we're going um, in this new season. And um, I don't want you to miss Sunday morning. I don't, unless you're uh, dealing with symptoms, I don't want you to miss Sunday morning. We're going to, I know, I just, I can go tell you, I know that God is going to show us some things in his spirit and in his word that's going to take us to another level. I just know it. So we're going to be, we're going to have rocks, we're going to have bridges, we're, we're going to have a good time. It's going to have a good time. With that said, this Saturday, uh, Brother Luis and Miss Jordan are getting married here at the church. You're all invited because of a, a number of reasons. Uh, they want all of their family, all of their friends to be able to celebrate with them, us to be able to fellowship and eat with them. Uh, even the folks that they were working with to do catering um, has kind of acted a little gun shy about things and understandably so. Y'all know that family has gone through it this year. From that car wreck on New Year's, to uh, COVID, uh, Trisha's sick, Gerald's sick. Gerald just came home from the hospital today. Come on, somebody. Thank you, Jesus. Our, our Miss Anna, I don't know if Miss Anna's watching tonight. Oh, but sweet Miss Anna has been terribly sick these last couple of days. And now here they are planning a wedding on Saturday. So um, I said, y'all sure you want to have it? I don't know. Luis made that face. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Trisha said, we're having it too. We're going to have this wedding. So uh, you're all invited Saturday, but no reception. We're going to come back and circle back at another time to have a big old party and celebrate with them and have the reception at a later time. And I said, that's a great idea. I, I, we support you 110%, but we'll still be here for the service Saturday. So that's it. With, with, with no further ado, let's continue to worship the Lord tonight with our giving. Woo! God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. We missed being here this past Sunday, and we were watching online, uh, driving back. And um, I've told a few, it's not real fun when you're not feeling 100% and traveling, but it made it a whole lot better when you were able to sit and listen to some good preaching Sunday morning. Good preaching Sunday night. Oh, I'm telling you what, we had a good time in that car. And uh, I believe I'm going to stand on the word. And I believe I'm going to fast and seek God's face. I'm going to seek him, Sister Paula. I'm going to seek him like I've never sought him before. Let's just make that New Year's resolution together. If you're doing good with God and you say, I have a good relationship with the Lord. I love him. I'm praying. I'm reading my Bible. Awesome. Awesome. But let's just make the decision. But you know what? Tomorrow, I'm going to go a little further. I'm going to go a little deeper. I heard somebody comparing our relationship to the Lord with riding a bicycle. You go ahead and get on that bicycle and don't pedal it and see how, how balanced you are just sitting there. Motorcycle. Now, you need to be moving. Come on, somebody. So that's what we want to do with the Lord. And this year, we're going to be moving and uh, moving forward. We're going to worship the Lord tonight with our given. Proverbs 21, verse 26 says something to the effect of the unrighteous or the unbeliever goes around all day long craving, craving, just wanting more, just wanting more. But the righteous is always giving, always giving, always giving, always giving. The King James says it this way. But the righteous give without sparing. Give without sparing. So if there's anybody in the room tonight who says, I know apart from Jesus, I'm a sinner. Apart from Jesus, I bust hell wide open. Boy, if you only knew what kind of sinner I was. I know who I was. I know who I was. But because of grace, I'm saved. And I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. And if you're in the room tonight and say, thank God, I'm righteous. I've been made righteous. Then we need to do what the word of the Lord says. It'll, it'll just be an outflow of who we are. We'll be givers. So tonight as you're leaving, our ushers will be out at the door. And you can drop your offering off there. But tonight, we need to go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to touch sick bodies and families that are going through stuff. And... Um, 
I didn't realize it, but Sammy had told me that one of the little girls in his class, it was his, her, his, her mother that had passed. Then she came in today and said that one of the little boys, his father had passed, last name Martin, over the Christmas break. So there's two children in his class right now that came back from the holidays, one without a mother and one without a father, sitting in the same class. And I just stand and my heart breaks for that little girl who doesn't have her mama now. Or doesn't, or that old boy doesn't have his daddy now. And uh, we just need to pray. They're hurting people, broken people, um, families that are under attack. So let's just take, I ain't going to hurry. Let's just take a minute right now and we'll pray over the offering. But let's turn this into a moment of intercession. Because you know names and you know people having surgeries and all sorts of things going on. Let's just begin to pray. Holy Ghost, we thank you. We come into your presence with thanksgiving. We come worshiping. We come bringing an offering to you tonight, Lord. Oh, but I know what you want more than an offering. You want our obedience. So, Lord, we do. We come now obeying your command to pray one for the other. We intercede for our brothers and sisters who would be in this room tonight, but they can't be. Issues going on in their body, in their house. We pray, Lord, that you do exactly what you said you would do. And you provide healing from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. Thank you, Jehovah Rapha, for being our healer. We pray, God, that you would provide healing from the inside out in Jesus' name. Their spirit man, their minds, their marriages, their children. Lord, that you would come and reach in by your precious Holy Spirit. And you would do a work in them as only you can, that their eyes would be open. And every evil spirit, and every demon, and every devil that's been assigned... To come and tear us away from the Lord. Hear our voice tonight. We speak and we declare that freedom must come in Jesus' mighty name. We command you to take your hands off of their ears and off of their eyes and off of their hearts. That they would see the truth and the truth would set them free. We pray for that great revelation to come to us even now tonight as we open this word. Lord, as we study these scriptures, bring revelation to us that we would see Jesus and we would fall in love with Jesus more than we are right now. That when we leave this building, Lord, let that be our testimony. That we love Jesus more now than we did an hour ago. I just love him more now. I love him more now. I love him more now. Hallowed be thy name. We love you, Jesus. We honor you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Will you just turn and prophesy to somebody sitting next to you tonight or behind you or in front of you and just tell them Jesus is the same. Tell them Jesus is the same. He's not changed in 2,000 years. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Jesus is the same. Doesn't matter how many years you spend on this earth, Sister Purvis. Happy birthday, Sister Purvis. Happy birthday. Brother Purvis, does she look better than that? You got them cataracts gone. My goodness. He said, I don't know. Before, I saw two or three of her. Now there's just one. If you have your Bible tonight, we're going to be in John chapter 17. We're going through and doing this Bible study. And again, I didn't like uh, doing things the way we did it last week, online only. But God still shows up and still moves. And so um, we, we stopped a little early in John 16, just to kind of a quick review. In John 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples one more time before he prepares to head to the cross. And um, let's do that. Let's go into reading John 16 first. Let's just finish up John 16. John 16, let's look at um, verse 20 through 22. John 20, or 16, verses 20 through 22. He says, verily, just as Jesus is talking, verily, verily, I say unto you that you shall weep. Not, not necessarily what we want to hear going into the new year. I'm saying unto you, you'll weep and you'll lament and the world shall rejoice and you'll be sorrowful. Huh. But, I love that, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, when she's in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. It hurts. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And you now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, 
and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy, your joy, no man taketh from you. Now, we know he's talking to his disciples about the crucifixion. We know that. But I believe this is a message that carries on over to 2022. We were saying it last night in prayer. I know, I know that the enemy is coming against me and coming against my children. I know it. I know that there will be times this year where we get telephone calls or we get messages or we get diagnosis where the enemy is attacking and coming against us. We are foolish if we believe that this year suddenly all of our problems are going to disappear. No more trouble. When Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. Right? I know what the psalmist says in Psalm 34. He says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Of this I can be confident. I'm sure that the devil has some plan in place for my boys. I shouldn't be surprised. Peter said that. Don't be surprised when you enter into fiery trials. Is this some some strange things happening? What's happening to me? I got sick. I don't understand. This is weird. Why are my kids not behaving? People at my work don't like me. I don't get it. I just don't understand. What's wrong with me? There ain't nothing wrong with you. The Bible says many are the afflictions of the righteous. I'm not, I should not be surprised at all when we get a phone call in the middle of the night that says some of our students are involved in a car accident. I shouldn't be surprised by that. Shouldn't be. Because I know what the enemy does. He immediately comes to seal. How many of you get in fights with your wife and your husband before you get out of the parking lot of the church? Don't raise your hand. The devil immediately comes to steal. Immediately comes to steal. The word that's been sown. I shouldn't be surprised to lose my job. Shouldn't be surprised when people miss. I shouldn't be surprised by that. I know that's coming. Jesus is warning his disciples. There will be days ahead where you're going to weep, where you're going to lament. But, <laughs> but... For every phone call you get hearing that this family is separated or these kids have gone wayward or this diagnosis has come. With the same, I said it last night, with the same confidence and with the same assurance that I know the enemy is building and creating a weapon to try to kill my children and try to get them mixed up in drugs and alcohol. I know he's doing it. I know he's doing it. I know right now he has a plan for Sam's life. He has a plan to take out Benny. I know it. He, he's, he's after my, my marriage. I know it. He wants Nadine and I's marriage to fall apart. He wants us to be another statistic, another pastor that's left the ministry because he's gotten an immorality. I know he's planning. He's gunning for me. He's got my name and my picture posted somewhere in hell. And there's an assignment. There's a demon or a devil that said, go after him. I know it. I know that weapon has been formed or fashioned, but with the same assurance, the word of the living God says that no weapon that's formed against me shall prosper. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. I know the fiery darts are coming, but I know there's a shield of faith that will quench every fiery dart. I know he's gunning for my babies. I know that there's going to be sickness and illness that he tries to bring down the pipe. But I know that there is a God who is faithful. He'll bring me through this year like he brought me through the last one and the last one and the last one. Because Jesus has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's delivered us. I love that depiction of the woman having a baby. Come on, one day you're going to be delivered. That baby is going to be delivered. You can go in that delivery room and that baby's going to be delivered. Jesus has delivered us. He's delivered us. The one thing Jesus says in, in John 16, he didn't deliver us from was persecution. He didn't die on the cross to say, now everybody's going to like you and you're not going to be persecuted. Go on and look back in John 16. Let's do a 20... Um, Twenty. Well, let's start back in twenty. Verily, verily, I say to you that you shall weep and lament, but the world, the world. What, who is he talking about? The world, the, the unbeliever. The world's going to rejoice. The world's going to rejoice. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be hated. It's coming. We'll see it again in John seventeen. The enemy's going to. People are going to hate you. People are going to hate the church. 
And, and that's, this is why I really wonder if the church, we've been doing it right all of these years because Jesus promises persecution to those who are living a righteous life. And I wonder how many churches in South Georgia are being persecuted right now. How many churches in South Georgia are being persecuted by the community? How many believers sitting in the room tonight are dealing and facing with persecution? Because if we're doing it the right way, if we're doing it the right way, when we have a real encounter and an experience with, with Jesus, Jesus was persecuted. But you, have you ever noticed when he was sitting there building tables and chairs with Joseph there in the carpentry? He didn't have any problems then. Nobody hated him then. Peter. Peter was a good old southern boy. Fishing. He loved to fish. Good old southerner. He was. And he loved to fish. He didn't have problems with people. He was fine. He was okay. It was was when he starts uh, uh, praying for a lame man. And the lame man gets up and begins to walk. Now, Peter, you're in trouble. Paul. Paul never had to run for his life. Paul never had to hide. Paul never had to worry about being arrested. Not once until he had a real encounter with Jesus. In that moment, Stephen, think about Stephen. Everybody likes Stephen as long as he's minding his business. But now when he begins doing the miracles and the wonders, now we're going to take out and stone you and kill you. If we as a church this year begin to operate in the supernatural, that's what we're talking about Sunday. The supernatural. If we begin to operate and do what Jesus has called us to do as individuals, not just as a church, but as individuals, we should face persecution. Jesus says you're going to have problems. You're going to have persecution. Then he goes on and he tells his disciples, but you pray. This is how you get through it. John 16, 23. And in that day, you'll ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. Verse 24. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall, not, not a question, not a maybe, you shall receive my favorite part, that your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. Jesus is instructing his disciples. He says, here's the secret to endure the pain that's coming, to endure the persecution that's coming. Prayer. You pray. And you pray who? To the Father in the name of Jesus because that name has power. And when we use that name, he answers those prayers and that our joy can be full. He says, pray. There's going to be pain. There's going to be problems. There's going to be persecution. But i got an answer for you. I'm going to tell you to pray. And then he ends up the chapter talking about, and then I'll give you, listen to this, perfect peace. John 16, 33. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have, I'm reading from a different translation. I love this. Perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulation and trials and distress, and frustration. Anybody want to say amen to any of these adjectives? Tribulation, trials, distress, frustration. But Jesus says, but be of good cheer. And I love this translation. Take courage. Be confident. Be certain. Be undaunted. For I have overcome the world. I love it. I have deprived it of its power to harm you and have conquered it for you. That's what it means to overcome. When Jesus says, I overcame the world, this is what it means. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. And he asked him in John 16, 31, do you believe me? Come on, is anybody here tonight that says, I believe you, Lord. I believe you, Lord. I believe you, Lord. And then Jesus in John 17, he begins to practice what he preaches. He begins to pray. In John 17, he begins to pray. One of the most powerful prayers in Scripture. There's some good prayers in in the Bible. Y'all know that? Some powerful prayers in the Bible. I'm going to read maybe one of these here of Solomon's prayers. This is Solomon in 1 Kings 8. I didn't give you any of these scriptures back there. I'm sorry. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 22. Powerful prayer. Solomon's prayer of dedication. Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands towards heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath who keepest covenant and mercy with your servant that walks before thee with all their heart. 
who's kept with thy servant David, my father, that you've promised him. You spake also with your mouth and have fulfilled it with your hand as it is this day. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, Keep with your servant David, my father, all that you promised him, saying, There shall not fall you a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that your children take heed to their way, that they walk before me as you have walked before me. And now, O God of Israel, let your word, I pray you, be verified, which you spake unto your servant David, my father. Will God indeed dwell in heaven? Behold, the heavens and the heavens and the heavens of the heavens cannot contain you. How much less this house that I've built you, yet will you have respect unto the prayer of your servant will you still answer my prayer oh lord my god to hearken unto the cry and to the prayer of your servant that prayeth before you to this day that your eyes may be open towards this house night and day even towards the place which you have said my name shall be there oh lord will you do it oh what a powerful prayer god will you just look over this place God, I know you can't live in a building. It's too small for you. But I'm asking, would you come and abide with us? That's a prayer I'd pray over my house. Lord, I know you don't live in brick. And I know you don't live in mortar. And you don't live in carpet or wood floors. Oh, but God, would you hear my prayer and come into this house and live in this house? Oh, God, I know that I can't contain you all in my body. But will you fill me until I overflow? What a prayer to pray. There's some awesome prayers to pray. Let me do another one. Exodus 32. Exodus 32, Moses' Moses' prayer. When he finds out the children of Israel down there making idols and sinning and all sorts of horrible stuff. And Moses prays in Exodus chapter 32. Awesome prayer. Powerful prayer. We need to learn these prayers. Standing in the gap for our brothers and sisters who aren't living the way they need to be living. Verse 11. Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why do you wrath wax hot against your people? Which you've brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out. To just slay them in the mountains and consume them from the face of the earth. Oh, turn from your fierce wrath and repent of this evil against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swear us by your own self. And said to them, I'll multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven. Oh, what a prayer. Can you see? He's interceding. He's standing in the gap for these people that deserve to be wiped off the face. Deserve death. Is there anybody that says, that was me. I deserved it. But there was some intercessor. There was a little mama sitting on a rocking chair somewhere. There was a grandmother sitting in a little mill house in Deaton Street praying. And say, oh, God, would you spare them? Oh, Lord, would you keep them? Come on, I remember another prayer. Come on, Jesus, if there just be 50, if there be 40, if there be 30, will you spare Sodom? Will you spare Gomorrah? There was somebody standing in the gap that's an assignment you and i have to, and we have that power for god to look and say okay fine i won't kill him Woo! i'm gonna give him another day to repent another chance to repent i'm gonna keep him from that car wreck i'm gonna i'm gonna be merciful and gracious until they have that opportunity to bow their knee and to pray oh what kind of power there is in prayer some of the most powerful prayers we have access to every day if we just open this book and john 17 is probably the greatest one of the greatest of them all. My God. Old uh, Luther's buddy, Philip Melanchthon, said this about this chapter. He said, There is no voice which has ever been heard either in heaven or in earth more exalted, more holy, more fruitful, more sublime than this prayer. Offered up by the Son of God Himself. They call this the high priestly prayer. So we got the Lord's Prayer. This one in John 17 we call the high priestly prayer. This is His priestly prayer. One of the most powerful prayers we have in Scripture. And, and we know what prayer is. Prayer is supposed to be me talking to the Father and God and communing with God. Right? We know that's the purpose. Um, sometimes we, we miss it. and We, we have teaching prayers. And, um, you know, Nadine burns the toast. And when I say something about it, she gets a little snippy. You know. She talks ugly to me. And so come, come devotion time that night when we all sitting in the bed reading our scripture. It's time to pray, you know. I'll pray for it. Lord, please uh, touch my wife and... 
let her realize what your holy word says, that she is to honor me as uh, the church honored Christ Jesus. And Lord, please help her to know to walk in love and to be kind at all times, Jesus. Y'all, y'all ever pray like that for some way? Lord, please just let them stop being so mean, Jesus. One of them teaching prayers. You know, the pastors are real bad of having uh, preaching prayers. This one pastor, he was finishing up, leaving, shaking everybody's hand out in the lobby, and this lady's walking out, shook his hand, and said, I enjoyed both of your messages today. The one I only preached, the one, sister. I'm talking about the one you preached in your sermon and the one you preached in your prayer. Y'all been in those services? God, let your people know today that they need. To, I, I'm guilty of that sometimes. We'll get to pray and we're, pre, we're pre preaching the message we just preached and we're going to preach it again in our prayer. Lord, remind us what John 3 says. God, we, oh, we get into it and we'll preach the whole sermon in our prayer. The, the goal of our prayer life isn't to try to teach somebody. It's not to try to stick it to somebody. It's not to preach. It's to commune with the Father. But there's prayers like this one. I think Jesus could get away with it. There's prayers and times in Scripture where Jesus, and I think he's the only one that should attempt it, prayed with the intention of the people around him hearing that prayer. Think about outside of Lazarus' tomb. God, I know you always hear me, but so these here will know, right? There was times, and I believe this is one of them, where he prayed intentionally there with his disciples. A prayer that when they hear it and they listen to it, and when we read it all these years later, we can glean and we can learn from it. This is a prayer that we can learn from. So Jesus begins to pray. It's a powerful prayer. It's a short prayer. It's the longest uh, prayer we have that, that Jesus prayed. Longest recorded prayer that we have of Jesus. Only about 650 words. Take you maybe three minutes and 30 seconds to read it. Don't take long to, to pray in public and see the power of God fall when you spend your whole life in private, spending time with the Father in prayer there. You don't have to be some big thing. You can get in here and touch God because you've been touching Him all day long in your prayer closet. Amen. But it's the longest one we have. Powerful prayer. He starts in verse 1. These words spake Jesus... And lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your son. That your son also may glorify you. He knows it's his time to die. From the beginning of his ministry, he's looking at his mama, telling his mama, Mama, ain't my time yet. What do you want me to do, mama? What do you want me to do? It's not my time yet. But he knows the time for him to die has come. He knows it. I mentioned Luther earlier when he was there getting ready to be executed they recorded his prayer and i'm not making fun of him at all because i'd probably be praying the same way but the whole prayer was oh lord help me oh god where are you lord what am i going to do god why have you failed me lord have you forgotten about me oh god help me oh lord jesus help me. you go read it oh lord oh lord i mean it's just stammering and start that's how i've been praying too somebody was writing that prayer down that's, that's what makes me laugh martin luther's over there praying somebody's like hold on i didn't get that oh lord oh lord oh lord three times oh lord I'm about to die. Lord, help me, Lord. Jesus' prayer, he knows he's about to die. But look at this. Look at this. It ain't no whimpering and mamsy pamsy. He goes right to it. Now, God, this is my hour. This is, this, this is the hour. From, 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 the day, from day one, he's been watching the clock, anticipating this is the moment. There's a seed time and there's a harvest. He says, this is the time right now that the seed is about to go into the earth. And when that seed is planted, when that seed dies and is planted, there's going to be a harvest coming. There's an anticipation. He prays later and you see like sweat like great drops of blood. And God, if there's any other way to do this thing, take it from me. Let this cup pass from me. But here we see a prayer of consecration where he says, God, glorify me in this. I'm ready. Here we go. Glorify me. There's different ways to break this prayer apart. We'll start out with that one. Glorification. He starts out praying for glorification, glorification. Lord, let me see and let me know. Look at verse 1 one more time. These words spake Jesus, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son, that your son also would glorify you. The word that's used there is doxazo, doxazo. It's where we get the word doxology. 
the doxology, you know, a church service, a worship service, it's, it's a little moment of praise, a, a short uh, burst of praise that's given in a lot of churches. Here's our doxology. The word doxadzo, this is what he's asking, Lord glorify me, means this. To think, suppose, or be of opinion. To praise, extol, magnify, and celebrate. To honor, to make glorious, to clothe with splendor, to make renowned, to render illustrious, to call, here's the one that gets me about thinking about Jesus, to cause the dignity and the worth of some person or thing to become manifest and acknowledged. That's the one. To cause the dignity and the worth of some person or thing to become manifest and acknowledged. There are people, many of us, we all want it to. We all want people to see my value, my worth. I want people to know my worth. Jesus talks about it in Matthew when he says some folks, they want to go and give alms and give money to people. And they want to do it out in front of everybody. So that, and he says, and you'll receive glory. You'll receive glory from men. You'll receive your reward. He uses the same word. You'll receive glory. I, I want to do things because I want people to know my value and my worth. People are seeking that. Jesus prays and says, let them see and know my value. Come on, Jesus is not, <laughs> Jesus is different. My value and my worth. One writer said this, it'll bring no glory to the Father if Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is not acceptable or if the Son is not restored to his rightful place in the presence of the Father, unshielded glory. That would mean the divine mission had failed, the purpose of grace forever defeated. But if Christ is crucified and if he raises from the dead, there's glory. Look at him continue to pray. Verse 4 and verse 5, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me. He hadn't even gone to the cross yet. He said, I finished the work that you gave me. He looks at it as a done deal. It's a finished work. Isn't it awesome to know he's still working on me? And he's still working on you? But from heaven, he looks down and says, they're already righteous. They're already holy. They're already, it's a finished work. Isn't that awesome? He looks and says, it's finished. It's a finished work which you gave me to do. And now, O oh, Father, glorify you me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. The glory I had with you, there's no question that Jesus is saying, I am God. Here it is right here. That's right, I didn't give you this scripture. Isaiah 42 verse 8 says, I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. But Jesus says, let me have the glory that I had before. Why? Because he's the son of God. He walks in glory. And his prayer is, now God, let us see that glory. Then he directs his prayer outward. Verse 9. He keeps praying, and he says this, verse 9, I pray for them. Here he is about to go to the cross. He's about to die, but look at his prayer. I pray for them. He starts praying for them, his disciples. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. Exodus says every time the high priest went into the temple, he would wear this thing on his chest and the names of the tribes would be there on these, uh, this breastplate that he had. And so every time he walked into the presence, the names of the tribes were before the Lord's eyes. Here we have the great high priest who's walking into the Father's presence and he's got my name and your name embroidered on his heart and embroidered on his chest. He's praying for us. He's praying for us. And he says, I'm not praying for these. Listen. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I'm glorified in them. Then he prays for them to be sanctified. Verse 17, so sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth, verse 18, as you have sent me into the world, even so I've also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. 
He starts praying for them. And the prayer is, first of all, here's glorification for, for him. Now sanctification for us. Glorification, sanctification. Anybody ever heard that word in church before? Come on, y'all. I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and a mighty burning fire. Pray the Lord keep my soul. Saved and sanctified. Anybody know what that word is? Sanctified. Being sanctified. Here's the definition. Sanctification. It means to be set apart for God's special pleasure and use. It implies, uh uh-oh, here's a big word. Ready? Holiness. Being set apart from the corruption of the world and for God's use. God wants us to be saved, be born again. Absolutely, we got that. I know I can be born again by grace. I love what Spurgeon says, though. You ready? Spurgeon says, if he gives you the grace to help you believe, get saved. If he gives you the grace to help you believe, he'll give you the grace to live holy after you believe. It's not a prayer. Pray a prayer and go to heaven. It's pray a prayer and be transformed and changed that I would be sanctified so that Jesus can use me. Why do I need to be sanctified? So that he can use me. He can use me. Look at, look at what he, how he word it. Sanctify them through thy truth, through thy word. There's the trick right there. Stay in the word. As you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Why be sanctified? Sanctification comes for service. We're sanctified. We're those vessels of honor in the house that will be used for God's glory. Service. He needs clean vessels to use us to serve other people. It's not something we have shouting church services. It's not about our hair and makeup. It's about when we walk out, we're living pure and clean so that God can use us to reach the world. Because I got, I got a message ready here for you tonight. I can spend another 20 minutes on 20 pages telling you, you ready? People are dying and going to hell. All of these people, these funerals we preach, well, we know he's in a better place. No, you don't. No, you don't. The way preachers preach funerals now, you'd think every last one of them that took their final breath, oh, they're they're up there fishing with with grandpa and uncle and all them. No, they're not. If they did not know who Christ Jesus was and lived for them, they went to an eternal damnation, to hell, because they didn't have right relationship with Jesus. Everybody doesn't go to heaven. Everybody doesn't become an angel. You don't become an angel when you die. If you don't know Christ Jesus, you go to hell. And the message and the mission of the church isn't to get clean. Just to get clean. It's not to have church. It's to have church. It's not to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Just to be filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, I want you to be in doing the power so that you can be bold witnesses of me. Bear with me as I read this tonight. I stood on a grassy sward and at my feet... A precipice broke sheer down into infinite space. I looked but saw no bottom, only cloud shapes, black and furiously coiled, and great shadows shrouded hollows, unfathomable depths. Back I drew, dizzy at the depth. Then I saw forms of people moving single file along the grass. They were making for the edge. There was a woman with a baby in her arms and another little child holding on to her dress. She was on the very verge. Then I saw that she was blind. She lifted her foot for the next step and it trod air. She was over and the children over with her. Oh, the cry that I heard. Then I saw more streams of people flowing from all quarters. All were blind, stone blind. And they all made straight for the precipice edge. There were shrieks as they suddenly knew themselves falling and a tossing up of helpless arms, catching, clutching at empty air. But some went over quietly and fell without a sound. Then I wondered with a wonder that was simple agony, why no one stopped them at the edge? I couldn't. I was glued to the ground. I couldn't even call out, though I strained and tried only a whisper would come. And then I saw that along the edge there were sentries. Guards set up at intervals, but the intervals were far too great. There were wide, unguarded gaps between them. And over these gaps, the people fell in their blindness, quite unwarned. And the green grass seemed blood red to me. And the gulf yawned like the mouth of hell. 
And then I saw, like a little picture of peace, a group of people <laughs> under some trees with their backs turned towards the gulf. And they were making daisy chains. You know what daisy chains is? You take the flowers and you kind of tie them together and make these beautiful little ornaments, chains. You, you know what I mean? With the flowers, the daisies. They were making daisy chains. Sometimes when a piercing shriek cut the quiet air and reached them, it disturbed them. And they thought it a rather vulgar noise. And if one of their numbers started up and wanted to go and do something to help, then all the others would pull that one down. Why should you get so excited about it? You must wait for a definite call to go. You haven't finished your daisy chains yet. It would be really selfish, they said, to leave us to finish the work alone. There was another group. It was made up of people whose great desire was to get more sentries out, more guards out there. But they found that very few wanted to go, and sometimes there was no sentry set for miles and miles of the edge. Once, a girl stood alone in her place, waving the people back. But her mother and other relations called her and reminded her that her furlough was due. She must not break the rules. And being tired and needing a change, she had to go and rest for a while. But no one was sent to guard her gap, and over and over the people fell like a waterfall of souls. Once a child caught a tuft of grass that grew at the very brink of the gulf. It clung convulsively and it called, but nobody seemed to hear. Then the roots of the grass gave way and with a cry the child went over. Its two little hands still holding tight to the torn off bunch of grass. And the girl who longed to be back in her gap thought she heard the little one cry. She sprang up, wanted to go, at which they reproved her. Reminding her that no one is necessary anywhere. The gap would be well taken care of. They knew it. And then they sang a hymn. And then through the hymn came another sound. Like the pain of a million broken hearts wrung out in one full drop. One sob and a horror of great darkness was upon me. For I knew what it was. The cry of the blood. Then thundered a voice, the voice of the Lord. And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of your brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. The tom-tom still beat heavily. The darkness still shuddered and shivered about me. I heard the yells of the devil dancers and the weird wild shrieks of the devil possessed just outside the gate. What does it matter after all? It has gone on for years. It will go on for years more. Why make such a fuss about it? God forgive us. God arouses. Shame us out of our callousness. Shame us out of our sin. Man had a vision of hell. People dying and going to hell, falling over a gap, falling over a gap, falling over a gap. And the church was sitting around making daisy chains and singing hymns. We were having church. And we were putting up new signs, putting in new carpet, picnic awnings, and having our youth uh, services and pizza parties. And all around us, there were people dying and going to hell. But now we'll come in here and pray for them. Oh, now we'll pray. Oh, Lord, we'll pray. But then when we leave the building, do we do anything about it? Mount man up there in North Carolina, where you're from. Somebody drove past him up on the corner of the mountain. He was standing outside of his house. His house was on fire. He said, buddy, your house is burning down. He said, I know it, but I'm out here praying for the rain. He wasn't doing nothing to put it out. We'll sit in here and pray, God save us, Lord send people, God help us. But what are we doing? We're sanctified for a purpose. We're sanctified to serve. We need to put a little bit of action with our prayers. A little girl got mad at her big brother because the big brother put all these little traps out in the woods trying to trap squirrels and birds, but the, the, the or squirrels and raccoons and stuff, but birds got in it. And she didn't like it because she liked them little yellow birds. So she went home and she prayed and she asked God to help her brother to stop catching them birds. And her mama said, well, honey, how do you feel now? She said, I feel much better. God answered my prayer. I went out there and I kicked up every one of my brother's traps and got rid of them. Put a little bit of action to your prayer. We're going to do something about it. We're going to pray for people to get saved. But now let's get out here in these traps. These people who are dying. These people are falling into the lake of fire day by day. We're sanctified. I'm here to be holy. Why? Because I want the anointing of God to be, come in me. Oh, wait till Sunday. I want that anointing to flow into me. I want his glory and his power to be in me. Why? So somebody write a book about me? So I'd be on television? 
Why do I want that power and that anointing on the inside of me? Because tomorrow I'm going to meet somebody who's on their way to hell. And if I have the glory and the anointing on the inside of me, the Bible says it's the anointing that destroys every yoke and every stronghold. I need to be sanctified for service. God says, I'm going to send them into the world. He didn't say, I'm going to send them into the church. I'm going to send them into the world. Get ready, folks. We're about to go into the world. Come on, y'all. We're about to go into the world. And we're going to see souls saved. I'll close with this. 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 22. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man, therefore, purge himself, Purge himself. God, clean us. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. So flee also youthful lust, and follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I think we need to pray tonight and just ask the Lord, God, sanctify me. Lord, sanctify me. Sanctify me. God, take me further in you. Take me for, let's just take three or four minutes just to pray before we leave. Take me further in you, Jesus. I ain't doing no worse than I was last year. But are we doing better? Are we doing better? Have we laid down some things for the Lord? Have we grown in our relationship with Jesus? Can I say I'm closer to the Lord today than I was yesterday? Australia, their coat of arms, you know, we have our, our eagle here in America. Australia has a coat of arms, and it's got a kangaroo and an emu on their coat of arms. And you kind of think, well, you know, Australia, you know, the eagle's better. But, but here's why they did it. Because neither one of those animals can move backwards. And they're at the bottom of the motto, or they're coat of arms that says something to the effect of uh, moving forward and moving. I, I think as a believer, we should never get settled in what we know about Jesus and where we are with Jesus. Never. And we definitely shouldn't be moving backwards, but praying God sanctify me. Move us forward. Move us forward. Take us deeper, Jesus. That's our prayer. Take us deeper, Lord. Jesus, we recognize that outside of the four walls of this church, this building tonight where we're so safe and cozy and warm in your arms, that there are people all throughout this community in South Georgia, homes. Lance has been in some of them. We've borne witness to some of them, full of drugs and pain and anger, abuse, violence of all kinds. Children who've never heard the word Jesus uttered in their house other than as a curse. Lord, we realize that all around us in this community, in our city, in our nation, we're surrounded by people who are facing difficulties and problems, and they don't have a promise of peace. They don't know what it is. So, Jesus, we're asking tonight that you put some sort of hunger and desire on the inside of us. Lord, that when we leave this place, we would leave ready to go and to minister, to win the lost, to see them saved at all costs, by any means necessary. Whatever we have to do, Lord, we're willing to do it. We're willing to leave our comfort. We're willing to leave the familiar. We're willing to do church different. We're willing to pray different. We're willing to preach different. By any means necessary God that my son doesn't go to hell that that weapon that's been formed and fashioned against my grandson that weapon that's been formed and fashioned against my daughter that weapon that's been formed and fashioned against my it won't work Lord I'm praying now Holy Ghost open my eyes and let me see Jesus like I've never seen him before purge me and cleanse me someone here in this room tonight you need to pray that prayer and just ask him he's so sweet he's so kind he's not mad at you he, he's not angry with you he loves you he wants to wrap his arms around you but would you just allow him will you grant him the permission to come into your heart and to clean you up will you just ask him oh Jesus I'm asking you here's my body here I am Lord would you come and sanctify me will you wash me and cleanse me with your blood Lord I'm praying Father that you'll sanctify my mind my mind has been tormented it's just been all over the place and so many things so many distractions I'm asking you Lord will you wash me I'm asking you, Father, will you come in, Jesus, will you come into my heart and will you restore that innocence and that purity 
that I had as a little boy, as a little girl, so sweet, so tender, so tender hearted, just kind to everyone. Not an evil thought, not an evil word, just sweet. Lord, would you allow me the privilege to be born again? Let me be that little boy again. Let me be that little girl again. Crawl up in your arms, clean and holy and pure. A clean slate. A clean slate. Sanctified and purified. Oh, Lord, would you do that in me? Lord, would you forgive me of all my sin? Lord, sins of omission, sins of commission, things I should have done, but I didn't do it. When I should have worshipped, I should have prayed, I should have witnessed, I should have ministered. Lord, will you forgive me when I missed it and I didn't do it? Forgive me for not pouring into my family and pouring in. Forgive me for the words that I've spoken. Forgive me for the things that I've allowed in my heart and my mind. I'm asking you, I come to you caught in the act. Nothing goes unseen by you. Nothing. And I kneel before you, Jesus, and I ask you, oh God, would you save me? Would you save me? Sister, brother, hear his voice tonight. Oh, hear him say, where are your accusers? Go ye and sin no more. Do you hear him say, I'm giving you a fresh start. I'm giving you a redo, a do-over. I'm giving you a new beginning. I'll allow this to be a new day. You don't have to wait till January the 1st. Tonight, I'm willing to wipe away, wipe your slate clean like it never happened. Like it never happened. Justified. Never happened. Never happened. And to let you wake up tomorrow a brand new creature, a brand new person. Oh, do you hear me? He'll let you be a totally brand new person. He'll recreate you from the inside out. He'll restore everything the devil's stolen from you this year. Everything he's taken from you. Every bit of peace. Every bit of joy and hope and love. He'll restore it back to you. He'll restore it back to you. He's a God of justification. He's a God of restoration. He's a God of restoration. Will you stand with me all over the room tonight and just lift your hands to him and just thank him. Father, we say thank you. Oh, Lord, we say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We consecrate ourselves one more time to you. Here we are, Lord. Here we are, Lord. Glorify, Be glorified in us, Jesus. Be glorified in us, Jesus. Lord, that we would live a life of glory. We would live a life that would be seen to people around us and they wouldn't brag on us and talk about us, but they would see Jesus in us, his worth and his value. I bless every man and woman in this room tonight. Oh, Lord Jesus. Will you raise your hands? Will you just raise your hands? Oh, thank you, Lord. We just love you, Father. We love you, Lord. You're so good to us. You're too good. 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 Thank you, Lord. If you'll leave one hand in the air, but you'll take the other one and just lay it on your stomach, on your belly. Jesus says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This is where the spirit is, right here. This is where my spirit is, not my brain. It's right here in the deep part of me. It's just that, that gut, it's that inside that he's right here. Just asking, Lord, would you just come in? Will you clean this house? Will you clean this temple? Will you clean this tabernacle? Will you clean this vessel? Purge me, Lord. Purge me. Take a pickaxe and a shovel if you need to. And you get out every bit of dirt and every bit of uh, filth. Just dig it out of me. Wash it. Purge. I want to be purged. Purge. Any evil spirit. Any, any evil thought. Anything that doesn't belong in this body, in this heart, in this spirit, in this soul. I ask you to take it, Lord. I give it to you. I give it to you. I don't want to carry this around in me anymore. And I bless now. I bless this body, this tabernacle, this temple of the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord. You come and take up residence on the inside of me. I thank you. Uh, Hope, Jennifer, I thank you, Jesus, for blessing this baby right now in my womb. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. I know the enemy has a plan for my baby. Oh, but thank you, Lord Jesus. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. You're knitting this baby together well. Knit well, Lord. Knit well, Lord. With long life will you satisfy them and show them your salvation. They'll live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for preachers and prophets being birthed in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Who else is in here? Sister Griner, you lay your hand on that. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You knit well, Lord. Knit well, Lord. Knit well, Lord. Knit well, Lord. Thank you, Father, that out of our bellies those rivers flow. We thank you, God. Un, 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 
tapping and uh, redigging and uh, uncovering those wells on the inside of us. Spring up a well within my soul, sanctifying, cleansing water, washing of the water of the word. For that, Lord, we give you glory. And for that reason, tonight we pray, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Sunday, I know it's going to be good. We're going to talk about how to bring those supernatural things into this world. How supernatural things come into this world. And how you can experience supernatural, the good and the bad, unfortunately. So we're going to talk about some spiritual stuff Sunday. But you want to be here Sunday morning. Come ready. And then Sunday night, we've got some folks that are going to share some things with you. I'll be preaching, but we've got some other young folks that have some stuff they need to to just share with you. It's going to be good. So we'll see you Sunday. Come ready. Come hungry. Come thirsty. Thursday night, uh, young, uh, young adults will be meeting. Uh, Bible journaling for the middle school girls. Uh, Friday night, grief uh Grief group will be meeting uh, next. I want to say good grief. The good grief group will be meeting next door. Uh, Saturday, the wedding. Sunday, church. We love you. God bless you. When I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire.